You are listening to Beyond the Verse, a Star Citizen podcast. A show dedicated to Cloud Imperium Games, Star Citizen, and Squadron 42. Whether you fight, explore, unite, and or trade, we bring you news, updates, interviews, reviews, and analysis. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a pour of Radagast, and join us as we go Beyond the Verse. Launch sequence activated. Hello, friends, and welcome to the latest episode of Beyond the Verse Star Citizen Podcast. I'm your host, Solus, and this is episode 43. We're calling Siege of Orison. And this really came about almost in the last 24 hours. Uh, but there wasn't a lot to cover this week. In fact, this might be our shortest episode to date. Um, but last night they did give us a surprise. Um, earlier in the morning, they made um, a, a tweet or a social media post stating that uh, Siege of Orison and Patch 3.22.0 Alpha was going to be released later last night, and it did. Siege of Orison dropped, our Orgnite changed what we had planned on doing, um, and we reformed to take on Siege of Orison. But that's... That's really it. That, there's there's not a lot that happened this week. Um, besides a Tuesday lore drop of uh, Pyrotechnic Amalgamated, which was in a jump point several months ago. Um, and then this patch release. That's it. So uh, it was nice hearing from everybody. Take care. Have a good day. You- oh, totally kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. There's a lot to actually get into outside of just the news. And so I'm excited to do that. Let's go ahead and get started with messages from the community after a quick word from our sponsors. Welcome back. Here we go. Incoming message. I almost missed this. It's been a long time since I've gone back and I've looked at uh, reviews on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, um, and honestly, Spotify Podcasts. It's been a while since I've I've gone into that piece. I've gotten your emails. I've gotten your, your, your messages through the Q&A and the polls we ask on Spotify, but I just randomly decided to check Apple Podcasts and I came across a review that I would love to share with you. Uh, first off, Apple Podcasts, we have a five-star rating. I love that. It's going to help our message and our show, what you love and what you listen to. It's going to help us get to more people and build that community of the Star Citizen fam that we love so much. So please feel free to drop a five-star review in Apple Podcasts and really any podcast platform that you listen to. But leave a review because I will read every single one of them live on on air so on january 2nd i almost missed this it was 24 days ago um a listener by the name of whack attack love the name left a five-star review saying hype and positivity i'm just gonna read this verbatim and then respond to it heading into sitcon 2953 i was looking around for news and excitement to fill my time when I couldn't be playing Star Citizen myself. I nearly passed up Beyond the Verse podcast because it had no reviews, but I'm glad I didn't. I've regularly listened since episode 28, and I'm always excited to each new episode, for each new episode. Solus provides a positive perspective on the game, not blind to the faults nor overly critical of them either, painting a picture that is realistic and honest. I also find his treatment of guests, and there have been a few, to be very cordial, giving them room to speak and asking good questions for good conversation. The show has kept my hype and enjoyment of Star Citizen at a high since Sitcon, and I'm really looking forward to what's coming next for Star Citizen and Beyond the Verse. Happy to provide my review, despite Solus's vicious slander of my poor reliant Tana. Keep up the good work. Fly safe. Thank you so much for that review, Whack Attack. Um, I'm going to respond kind of in reverse order. The Reliant Tana, I think everybody makes mistakes, even developers. 
<laughs> even uh, game designers and engineers, uh, artists, and I think the Reliant Tana is is uh, is one of those. So much love. <laughs> uh, I actually dislike the Reliant Tana more than I dislike the Cutter Rambler. So there you go. There's there's where I stand. <laughs> but uh, to each their own. To each their own. Um, yeah. So for the rest of it, that is why I created this podcast. I um, just really quickly because you've heard this story before. But another podcaster and podcast team did this for me when I was getting into it in SWOTOR, when I was getting into it in Elder Scrolls Online. Um, They kept my hype when I wasn't able to be in game. So I want to be able to provide that to you, no matter where, no matter how you listen or watch Beyond the Verse podcast. So I'm glad to hear that that's coming to fruition. You did say since episode 28, some of our best material is before that. There's some really good interviews with Conif, um, with uh, Jorn, right? The Bar Citizen creator. Uh, so Jorn, man, we had Blasphemous. We've had Authy Gamer, which I think at that point is beyond episode 28. Um, but feel free to hop back and catch up on all of those. If you're on social media, my value proposition tweet that's at the top of my profile page has a list of which episode and which guest was on which episode. So feel free. So I wanted to share that. Thank you so much for everybody else listening. Follow suit. It'd be awesome to expand because of your voice, not mine. All right, let's get into the uh, Spotify Q&A from episode 42. Again, that was last episode, Red Festival. Um, It's actually number 15. In just seven days, it's the 15th most listened to podcast on our lineup. So it caught wind pretty, pretty easily. Um, And that's with me dying from COVID. So (laughs) something happened uh, and and I love that. But I really thought that that was going to bomb just because of my struggle of getting through the last piece of the lore. So I asked the question, what are your thoughts on CIG's sale of 2023 ships during the in case you missed it event. What did you purchase? So some of the context or the spirit behind that question was we already have, you know, IAE, ILW, Invictus Launch Week, uh, Intergalactic, the Interspace, oh, good Lord, Interspace, Intergalactic, Aerospace Expo, IAE, good God. Uh, But then we also have Alien Week and we've got all these events throughout the year. Just curious, like how we felt about yet another one called In Case You Missed It. Um, That happened or it's happening right now. So we had three responses. Patrick Haraway responds back with Star Citizen isn't my main game. I play for a week every few months. I wish I could just buy whatever has been made purchasable at any time. This time around, I did buy two Cutter Ramblers to upgrade with LTI. I think that's the sentiment with a lot of Star Citizen gamers, unless you're like a content creator who does this literally every single day or every other day. Um, Star Citizen is kind of like in your back pocket. A lot of people go off and play Red Dead Redemption, Baldur's Gate, there's Paul World evidently that came out, that's a thing. I'll have to like try it out and see what's going on with that. Um, but Star Citizen is always, it's always there. It's always consistent, right? It's a fall back to game for a lot of people. Um, and then when they do, they're like, man, I can't believe I left and now I'm going to really get into it. And then it dies off again, right? Like every other patch. Um, so that sentiment is definitely shared. I think that's, I think that's fair. It's fair sentiment. Um, the flying whatever is made pur- purchasable at any time. So there's a couple of responses here. One, Become a Imperator subscriber, and anytime there's like a new release for a month, or actually, I'm pretty sure it's any release at any time, you get free access to that ship. So if there's a ship that releases and you're a subscriber for that month, come back, like put down Animal Crossing, (laughs) come back to Star Citizen and fly the crap out of that ship. Um, And then, you know, you're good to go. So I think that's, that's not what you're talking about, but that is a dynamic. But the best time to play is during IAE, the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo, because every ship is on sale and flyable. So in that week or so, I think it's like two weeks or whatever, in that season, that's the time to come back, get into Star Citizen and have some fun. 
Your next main event is going to be the um, ILW or Invictus Launch Week. It's usually around the March, April time frame, so end of Q1-ish. But those are only military vehicles. It's a celebration of the UEE Navy. So it's it's military. It's like your gunships. Uh, you won't be able to fly an 890 jump, for instance. It's not a military ship. So there you go. Uh, next, Dakota Riley says, I think it's a great opportunity uh, for those who missed out and those of us who are new to the game and maybe didn't get the chance to purchase these ships during IAE or when they went on sale originally. I mean, 100%. Uh, ab- absolutely. For me... It's just stuffed, right? It's like very compact into two and a half months. So IAE is like November time frame. December, there's a lot of festivities and and I think it carries over. There's a lot of options in December. Um, it feels like, it seems. And then January, we have this thing. And at the end of January, January, we have the Red Festival. So there's a couple of opportunities to get new ships with new paint in the Red Festival. And then we got the Fortuna event. And I'm sure I'm skipping over some, like the Valentine's Day event. Um, but there's the Fortuna that's in March, uh, which is your only chance to get the Phoenix Emerald. Right. So there's just always something. And to be fair, Star Citizen still needs to make money. <laughs> Like, it's a, it's still a crowdsourced or crowdfunded game. I don't blame them for having yet another marketing event. So, last comment, Brandon Thomas. I like the In Case You Missed It sell. It helped me save money and CCU to both a Santok Yai and a 400i, which I wasn't able to get during IAE. Yeah, uh, anytime I see CCU, I get anxiety. There's a whole chain game if, if you want to get into that. I might have um, D-Rock on the podcast at some point to speak to it because he's really into the whole CCU upgrade chain game. Um, but man, every time I see that, I, 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 I get... <laughs> It's very complicated, right? Like you, you buy ships, you wait until other ships go on sale, then you ship upgrade to them, but then you don't apply the upgrade in your hangar. It's, it's weird. Like, <laughs> I don't know. To each their own power to you if you're smart enough to 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 play the CCU game. Anyways, congrats on the Santaki Yai, which is the alien. And to me, it's the alien version of the F8C. It's a phenomenal ship, very mobile, very agile. And then the 400 i is just a sexy yacht. It's a sexy yacht ship, um, kind of a smaller version of the 600 i So congratulations, Brandon. I also want to take a second and celebrate. Um, we do have our first uh, podcast supporter. And let me see if I can quickly just access this real quick. If you are, um, if you're interested in supporting what we do, um, every single cent that I make, I put right back into the show for quality purposes, for post-production purposes. I'm eventually going to have to replace this Go XLR um, amp or whatever you want to call it. My mind's going blank right now. I'm going to have to upgrade at some point, Rodecaster Pro too, more than likely. So everything is going to be going back to the show and for the the quality, right, that you get to experience. Um, one way to do that is becoming a monthly supporter. So I think I've set it at like $5. I um, can always adjust that, but the $5, uh, we have our first supporter. So I want to give a shout out to Mr. Dustin Thames, member of our organization as well. Much love. Thank you so much for becoming our very first monthly supporter. You can also subscribe. That's a whole different thing, <laughs> which we'll get into later. Um, last but not least, like on that monetization conversation, I've been doing the host read ads that you hear at the beginning of each podcast. That uh, I was notified is going away. Spotify is moving away from that. And instead, they're giving random ads um, in your ad blocks, whatever you denote as your ad block for your episode. I'm actually going to decline that. I loved the host red ads because I could make sure it met with my brand. I am very particular with my brand. Soul Provision Organization, if you're part of that, you know this is how I stand. Um, I have high expectations and high standards. And everything that I represent on this podcast speaks to my brand. It speaks to who I am, the culture, the community that I'm trying to build. I don't trust 
I do not trust, especially in 2024, I do not trust a company to kind of do that for me. I would hate to be promoting a certain culture, a certain community of love, passion, inclusion, um, and some idiot puts something stupid on my podcast for an advertisement. It's not okay. So, all right, let's move on. <laughs> I think that was a great segment. I was able to touch on a lot of things. Um, this is actually the last episode before our January monthly show review. Um, so I'm excited to get into the numbers. We have grown exponentially. No spoiler alerts, just stand by for that. I'm excited to share it when it happens. But let's get into this week in Star Citizen. I'm now sharing my screen for those of you on YouTube. I want this 400i. There's an image by user Rangers OD2, and it's uh, it's the 400i with like a gunmetal gray with like gold highlights. It is a sexy color combination. Moving on. Happy Monday, everyone. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who has been jumping into the PTU to test our latest 322 build, which comes with much needed fixes as well as improvements for Siege of Orison. There's still some work to be done and our team is full bore on this update to get it into your hands as soon as possible. The team is also hard at work on our next major update, Alpha 323, which we'll be talking about more in the very near future. In case you missed it, the filthiest race, that's very misleading, because in case you missed it is the name of the event going on right now, but this is actually used in context. In case you missed it, the filthiest race in the verse zoomed and zipped across the deserts of Crusader's second moon. We're of course talking about the Daymar Rally, and with a record number of participants, this was one for the history books. Miss the action? Check out the VOD, video on demand, on Atmo Esports' Twitch channel. Looking a little further into the future, we wanted to give an early heads up that our team will be in attendance for Bar Citizen Barcelona on February 3rd. Head over to barcitizen.sc for all the details, and we hope to see many of you there. Now let's see what's going on this week, still in the article. Tuesday, the narrative team has the latest portfolio lore post, first appearing in Jump Point 1102. Pyrotechnic Amalgamated revolutionized the search for resources and discovered two systems, but managing their namesake system would be their ruin. Obviously this is the, the history of Pyro. So I loved it when it came out in Jump Point 1102. We did cover that in a podcast episode, but we will read it again at the end of this episode. And then it goes straight into Friday has our latest weekly newsletter. <laughs> it is straight to your inbox. Inside Star Citizen and Star Citizen Live are taking one more week off this week. We also wanted to include this note from Jared, quote Disco Lando, Huckabee regarding the return of our evergreen programming like Inside Star Citizen and Star Citizen Live. I did post this on social media, so if you follow us, this is no news to you, but this is important. They're changing the cadence of, of their live programming or their evergreen programming, so pay attention. Here we go. Thanks, Jake. And hi, all. ISC and SCL are coming back on February 1st and 2nd this year. And I wanted to take a few moments to talk about a change in our scheduling for 2024 that reflects the ongoing changes to our development and what promises to be the biggest year yet for Star Citizen. While we're still going to be releasing on Thursdays and broadcasting live on Fridays, we are no longer going to be programming on the standard quarterly cadence we've used since ISC began, which has been a pretty rigid 10 weeks on, three weeks off, rinse and repeat sort of affair. In this new year of exciting challenges and anticipated releases, once ISC comes back on February 1st, it will continue to run until 3.23 comes out, however many weeks that may be. We'll then take a week or two off and come right back with the ongoing cadence until the next major patch comes out, and so on and so on. What this means for you is that we'll no longer be cutting away to our hiatuses a week or two before the patch releases like we've done in the past, and there may be a week or two in the middle of a month where we don't publish broadcast so we can still take care of the important maintenance tasks we normally do during the prior hiatuses. 
But most importantly, the way our new schedule works out, it means there will now be more episodes of ISC produced this year than previously, covering more topics and more aspects of our lives in game development than ever before. And everyone here on the ISC team is excited to tackle the added challenge. Star Citizen Live will remain the bastion of acerbic disco as it's always been. There's nothing to be done about that. Sorry. I think we all love Jared Huckabee. All in all, just as I stated at the end of last year's final show, I've never been more excited about the prospects of 2024. And we're looking forward to the extra shows, not just for more chances to cover the features and such, but more chances to explore new and different types of stories than we've done in the past about aspects of the game development we haven't covered before, too. We'll see you when we return next week. Back to you, Jake. Thanks, Jared. We're excited for our shows to return. See you all next week. For Light and Life, Jake Bradley. Jake Bradley also streams. Go check him out on Twitch. He's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, and then just quickly, I'm going to repeat this like for the 10th time. Monday was This Week in Star Citizen, Tuesday Lore Post. I'm adding in Thursday was the patch drop with uh, Siege of Orson. And then later today, which is Friday, the RSI Weekly Newsletter will come out. Public service announcement. In case you missed it, it's still going on. So you have until January 29th. That's three days from now. So that's Monday, I believe. I think it's Monday the 29th to buy all the ships that came out um, either released or in concept in 2023 or 2953 so there you go um again this is a light week but calm before the storm and i kind of mean storm in a good way <laughs> um so it gives me uh, kind of time to get a 30 minute to 45 minute podcast out there for y'all again i hope you find value in this there is org night 06 that i just published from last night's org night published it this morning and it's our three hour org night that took on siege of orison we uh went through the first two platforms before we 30 k then we went back and finished the entire siege of orison a lot of fun a lot of great stories and anecdotes and some fun dynamics between the 14 of us that were in group so super exciting go check it out let's get into this week's news so the first thing i want to cover I'm going to split everything up, right? I usually end the episode with lore. So we're going to actually start with last night's patch drop. So the patch notes and what we can you know, expect from it or what we did expect from it. And then we'll get into the lore behind Siege of Orison, which I just realized I got out of. <laughs> Here we go. I didn't actually pull back up Siege of Orison's website, which is not going to take long at all. Siege of Orison, the lore, and then we'll get into and we will end with the portfolio and pyrotechnic amalgamated. There we go. We are set up and ready to go. Sharing my screen for those of you on the tubes. So on social media, I post every time that there's a patch update. You probably saw five or six posts from me because they have been going at this in the PTU for probably two or three weeks now. Um, they finally released everything from the Siege of Orison's patch drop. Let's cover it. Here we go. Star Citizen Alpha 322.0A Live.9035564. Patch notes. <laughs> alpha patch 322.0A, 0 alpha, has been released and is now available to test in the live environment. Patch should show version 3, everything I just said. It is strongly recommended that players delete their user and shader folders for the public client after patching, particularly if you start encountering any odd character graphical issues or a crash on loading. The user folder can be found in default installations at Program Files Robert Spice, wow, Robert Space Industries Star Citizen Live. The shader folders can be found here. There's a bunch of nonsense. Um, I read that every time that there's an official patch note because it is important. If you are listening to this podcast, don't forget to do that. Every patch release, go into your live folder and delete the shader folders, the user folder and shader folders. Just do it. Start over. It's fine. It's going to help your smoothness getting into a new patch. 
Long-term persistence is enabled, meaning you keep all your gear except for consumables. So when you log in the next time, you're gonna have to choose whether you're male or female, you're gonna have to choose hair, and then you're going to have to get your ammunition back. You'll have your P4s, your P8s, your sidearms. Um, you'll even have your, and I can't believe I forget, the, uh, the paramedic device the white gun, you're gonna have all of those, right? You're gonna have your um, your multi-tool, right? But all of your med pens, ammunition, your frag grenades, not really sure why frag grenades are considered consumables, but I guess it's, I guess it's also ammunition. It's exploding ordinance, I guess it would be exploding ammunition. Anyways, uh, but anyways, you're gonna have to go in and you're gonna have to get everything refilled and restocked. So that's what long-term persistent means. Starting UEC, so for those of you just jumping straight in, I kept all 1.7 million UEC uh, that I had patch over patch. Um, I think this is more like if you're starting a brand new character, you're gonna start with 20,000 UEC, pretty sure. Unless that's just like an additional 20,000. I actually don't know that. So I'll welcome the comments in the podcast uh, if you know the answer to that. Characters in this new environment will be built from LTP data, so items such as med pens, ammo, rentals, and refinery jobs will be lost. There you go. All right, there's some known issues there. Feel free to go through and read it. I, I, it's, I don't know. That's what they're currently working on. It just didn't drop in this patch, so I usually just go right to the features update. So let's go. Let me get a drink real quick <laughs> so I avoid last episode's coughing and dying. Mm -mm -mm. All right. Locations. Features update locations. Increase damage output and health of defense turrets around the PU. Gameplay. Bounty ship cargo balance pass. NPC bounty contract ships have had their cargo manifest amounts lowered for economy balance. Ships and Vehicles, the Santok Yai Audio Polish Pass. Okay, I love the Santok Yai. I enjoy flying it. I actually like the audio. I know I've got people in my organization that don't. Um, I like the audio. It sounds really good. The problem, though, is it's very glitchy. Like, there are times that I get into the Santok Yai, I start everything up, I fly, do what I need to do. And it's weird. Like, the moment I get out and get away from the ship that alien um the alien like filter that they put on the engine that makes it like you know sound like it's alive it persists into the rest of the game and like that never goes away for me it's weird and i don't know if that's shared among other players or not but it's one of my experiences so hopefully the polish pass fixed that i didn't fly it last night so i don't know and we have multiple bug fixes so here we go Fixing the issue causing the ATC to fail to detect vehicles within the loading zone or fail to initiate cargo transfers. Using a tractor beam to move ships should no longer severely impact client frame rate. <laughs> nice. Fixed multiple issues causing shuttle transit at Orison to stop and become stranded before reaching its destination. Probably important for Siege of Orison. Fixed an issue causing tractor beams to fail to work on a container when multiple players interact with the same cargo container using a tractor beam. Klesher Rehabilitation Facility Transit Elevator should no longer go missing or block players from exiting prison. <laughs> it's like a permanent prison sentence. Love it. Fixed an issue causing ship maneuvering to fail when a player with a tier 1 injury is sitting in the co-pilot seat. It's random. Fixed an issue causing large sections of the Cutlass Black's hull to be invulnerable to damage. The external fuel rack on the Drake Cutter Rambler should now provide its correct quantum fuel capacity. Landing pad turrets at Security Post Korea should no longer despawn when streamed out. Fixed an issue causing melee takedowns on NPC enemies to not count as mission kills. Fixed an issue that could cause undersuits to be permanently lost when equipping armor. Selling at the commodity kiosk should no longer sometimes display a, quote, transaction cost mismatch dialogue, or be limited to selling one unit at a time. Fixed an issue that could cause the server FPS to drop then trying, when trying to repair a snub ship from a constellation with a custom loadout. Players should now be able to correctly press charges when ship is being towed by another player without permission. <laughs> oh god. 
I'm not going to touch that. Next. <laughs> Weapons should no longer fail to shoot and holster themselves after using med pens while sprinting. Fixed an issue causing missiles, bombs, and torpedoes to disappear immediately after traveling a short distance from the player. Mercury Star Runner AI in high risk target bounty missions should no longer spawn as civilians. Thank God. That was a huge, a huge issue. All right, specifically for Siege of Orison, I think this is a great segue because right after this, we'll be getting into what Siege of Orison is, the lore, and everything else. So this will be a good, a good like intro into that. The fixes: the iffy container code on Lieutenant's tablet should no longer display as zero. Thank you. That's important that we have that. Fixed an issue that could cause the island boss not to spawn. I really want to address that right now. Um, I might wait. We had a hard time. So when they say island boss, I'm assuming they're talking about the admin platform. It's like the last platform. And that boss was extremely hard to find. Now, what's funny is I didn't actually go into the Connex farm. Uh, is, what, is what we call it on Amazon. But the Connex farm... Um, the uh the place where they keep all the all the long 18 wheelers that's where we found the admin platform boss and again I'm, I'm assuming this is who they're talking about but it took us forever to find him inside of those connexes it was it was fun though i was outside flying pulling security so i wasn't inside of the uh of the fun but just hearing it and you can go back and listen to org night six um you can listen to it yourself but as the other 13 of us were inside. I mean, it took us 15, 20 minutes to find them. Not the same issue, but I wonder if there are further issues with, with that that still needs to be fixed. Let me clear my throat real quick. All right. Moving on, fixed an issue that could cause the lieutenant to spawn and get stuck under their spawn location. Restreaming in a Crusader platform after other players have left it should no longer cause Crusader ships to be destroyed. Fixed an issue causing the data hack screen to reset after being stopped by leaving the room and returning. Fixed an issue causing the Siege of Orison mission to not tell players to leave the platforms to complete the mission. Fixed multiple floating loot boxes. <laughs> that. That did not change. Uh, there's still many multiple uh, floating boxes, but fixed multiple floating uh, loot boxes located on admin center platforms. Siege of Orison Barge should no longer go missing on admin platform after multiple mission runs on the same shard. Fixed the issue causing Siege FPS AI to not leave their open spawn closets. Anti-air should now correctly shut down after disabling Iffy. Uh, AI will occasionally slide when moving in and out of cover. Spawn closets located at the bars should now spawn FPS AI correctly. Eliminating an island boss uh, before their marker appears should no longer cause mission objectives to fail or update from that point onwards. Players should no longer be able to fly Crusader ships out of the mission area. And Dolly Comms audio should no longer constantly spam players once the code is obtained at Solanke platform. And then three technical issues, fixed four client crashes, fixed 10 server crashes, and fixed a server deadlock. Um, yeah, so last night's, last night's Siege of Orison actually went pretty smooth. Um, and actually, just for aesthetic purposes, I'm going to share my screen because we're talking Siege of Orison. It went really smooth. We had a really great time. Um, other than that 30k that happened between like the second platform and the third platform, um, it was a lot of fun. There's a couple of like annoying issues, like uh, those in your party, the friendly targets that are on your screen do have like the blue triangle, so you know friendly from foe. That's great. Um, however. Not everybody in your party had a nameplate, so it was very difficult to call out command and control, um, you know, box on me or crate on me, or uh, I've been hit. I'm, I, you know, I'm. I, I need to. I need to be not resurrected. I need to be healed. Um, it's really hard to have those conversations when you don't have nameplates. So that was kind of annoying. 
the uh, the second piece is that we still had issues with like spawning um, enemies, like very glitchy, very like desyncing. Um, I think that's going to be pretty common with this game for for, for you know quite some time. But um, like you would shoot someone in the face a hundred times, and then they would appear behind you and shoot you in the back. Still some issues, you know, obviously playing, but for the most part, it was a lot of fun. We had some great success. And and again, like this brought us everything that I thought it would for an organization, right? I played this the last time it came out, had a good time, but it was like maybe me and three or four others. But you get an organization of 14 people together, it's a freaking blast. And they do really well. The story is told, let me... Clear my throat and get a drink. Hold on. So the story is told while you're going from platform to platform. Um, Dolly, I think I think it's Rowena. Rowena Dolly will get onto the comms and tell you the story, kind of who you're fighting, why you're fighting them, your objectives. Um, it's really well done, very immersive. You don't get a lot of like breaks like a load screen, right? You don't get a lot of things that hiccup. Um, so I think this is a very well done event. And I think more importantly, it shows us the potential of Star Citizen. If this is what a raid looks like in Alpha before raids are really a thing, this is extremely promising. It's extremely promising. Every single um, like combat game loop is found in this event. Right? You're driving ground vehicles while you're on a platform. You're flying once you've disabled the anti-air. Um, you got to fly to the admin platform. So we took one of the A2s. So most of the crew, 13 individuals, went into the A2. I drove the Ares, I think, Inferno. It might have been the Ion. Uh, I think it's the Inferno. Um, I took the Inferno as like a just a security ship. Um, but it, it's just a lot of fun. And it took you know, two and a half, three hours in order to do. So it's, I, I think this is very promising. And we saw in Sitcon, so Sitcon 2953, we saw them um, showcase raids in underground facilities, UGFs. There's a lot of potential here. And, and, and it is, it's like a merging of all of your favorite games. My brother will tell you that, you know, it feels like you're playing Call of Duty at some point. Right, whenever whenever things are, you know, happening as they're supposed to, but walking from building to building, you know, platform to platform, um, you're seeing it on the screen right now. It feels very good in the FPS format. So, I love everything about this event. I've been teasing the organization that like I can't wait to throw this in front of the org. We're gonna have a lot of fun. So last night, maybe hours before um, the the org nights event this happened and so i was so excited to share it so what is siege of orison Let, let's let's get into this siege of orison get ready to dive into an action heavy adventure that has turned the once idyllic city of orison into a nightmare read on for all the info that you need to survive the nine tail gang's campaign of violence including a mission rundown and tips from the designers themselves and it gives you the link for the new player's guide. And it was yesterday, January 25th to Monday, February 5th at 2000 UTC. So you got some time. We'll probably end up doing this again next Thursday for Org Night 7 just to get more you know, exposure. And this event does go away um, again, February 5th. So do it while it's live. Do it while it's here. And then we can move on and do something different but let's keep going. There's a video that I'm gonna go ahead and play. I didn't even prep this, I probably should have. Um, but let me throw on the video. Probably will have to adjust the volume. Um, but again, if you're on YouTube, here we go. Hey, happy birthday. Oh my God. We're under attack. Security and overrun. Here's the situation. Nine Tails attacked these commercial platforms. Gather any gear you need and help us take them back.
Got to give credit where credit's due. Uh, that is amazing media, uh, like hype video. Um, but yeah, everything you saw in that video, you you do. So there's flying, like I said, flying, driving, flying, or you said flying, wow, fighting, <laughs> um, gunfights. Um, oh, and here's here's like a little bit of like a pro tip. A lot of, uh, a lot of my org members were um, like anxious about getting their patch update, but then hurrying up and getting into the game so that they could outfit with ammunition and everything. Uh, here's the deal. There are enough dead bodies on that first platform that you can take one of your rifles, your sidearm, the one med pen that you're given on your hip. Um, you don't have to outfit yourself perfectly whenever you go there. Just wear heavy to medium armor. Um, and again, every, every weapon that you had going into this patch, you'll have one magazine with every single one. That's enough. Excuse me. That's enough. So once you get to that platform, kill one or two enemies, and then you could just live off of the drops. It's the easiest way to do it. Don't worry about, you know, fully kidding yourself. Um, just pro tip. All right, so let's get into a little bit of the lore. Uh, it's not the actual transition into lore, but this is still on the Siege of Orison's website. We're going to learn a little bit about the CDF and um, Rowena, Rowena Dolly. So here we go. Join the CDF today. The Civilian Defense Force. The Civilian Defense Force, CDF, is a civilian militia endorsed by the UEE Advocacy. Founded in 2947, it was created with the enactment of the Militia Mobilization Initiative as a way for law enforcement to enlist the public to help neutralize significant threats to the UEE systems. The CDF program is run under advocacy supervision, so local pilots must petition the advocacy for authorization to act on its behalf. The special agent in charge, CDF coordinator stands systems. Born and raised in Orison Crusader, SAIC Rowena Dolly served with a distinction in the UEE Navy as a logistics officer until she was recruited by the Marines. Since joining the advocacy, she has quickly risen through the ranks as a proven investigator and field agent. She volunteered to take over as attache to the CDF in 2948 and will be running this operation. Know your foe. Ninetales. Despite the shocking crime scenes it leaves behind, Ninetales is a relatively unknown criminal organization. However, it's proven through numerous well-publicized incidents that it's always willing to promote its cause through terrifying violence. Ninetales has gained a foothold in the Stanton system since its first documented appearance in 2938. The heavily armed outlaw gang now controls the officially abandoned Grim Hex space uh, the space station near Yella, where it stirs up chaos by distributing orders to those who want to challenge the authorities. Learn more about Nine Tales from our narrative team in the Inside Star Citizen episode below and the official Nine Tales portfolio. And then it goes on and shows the Orison Skyway uh, shuttle service. So that's always fun. You should save that and put it into your saved folders, your photo, uh, your photos, your screenshots save it because it is it's a nice guide especially if you have a friend who's new to the game and is not advised well enough <laughs> and picks orison as their starting location i think orison is the best starting location i am team boy orison but not for a day one starter if you're a day one starter area 18 is the best you load in, you literally walk a couple of feet, you get on one tram that takes like 45 seconds and you're at the space station. And when you log in, right outside of the habitation are all the shops you ever need, all the gear, all the clothing, ammunition, everything. Area 18 is the most simple. But as far as the best system, um, Orison is the best city in my opinion. It's the most beautiful. I feel like it's it has the most like aesthetically charming um, cosmetics, uh, but it's also the best system. Crusader is a great gas planet. Scary as shit when you fly through it. Um, it's I don't know. I also have the Lassophobia, so that might play into it a little bit. Uh, but I love everything about Crusader. But if you pick this as your starting location, just know you're gonna get lost. 
you're getting lost whenever you walk around Orison. This map will help. It also shows you when you use the shoveler and go from picture to picture, it'll show you all of the platforms. So here's a macro view of the Solanke Brushwood and Hartmore platforms and the admin center, but that's your path, right? So if you're looking on my screen, you're coming in from the left. Your first platform is the Solanke platform. Hug the right side. In fact, that's a good rule of thumb in all of these locations. Hug the right side if you don't want to get into the shit of combat. And you're going to go straight on to this platform that takes you from Solanke to Brushwood. When you get into Brushwood, I actually, Brushwood's one of my favorite platforms. There's a lot going on here. Many different levels, many different towers. Um, this is where you start getting into your ground vehicles. Um, and if you disable the anti-air, you can really get into um, flying around and helping out your buddies in that sense. Then from Brushwood, you're going to Hartmore. Um, Hartmore, kind of the same thing as Brushwood, kind of feels the same, looks the same, in my opinion. Still ground vehicles. It just gets bigger and more complex, right? A lot more towers to check to find the lieutenant. Um, a lot more connexes to check to see if you have the right, you know, connex with the right codes. Still have to disable the anti-air. And then you, you will have to get onto an aircraft um, on the Hartmore platform to fly to the admin center. And so again, not to repeat myself, but we found an A2 and we found an Ares Ion. And so I got into the Ion or Inferno. I'm pretty sure it's the Inferno. I got into the Ares. We'll call it that. <laughs> uh, provided security for the A2. And then, you know, we went into the admin center. Now, several Siege of Orisons ago, the admin center was a lot of a lot different of an experience. I remember flying to the admin center and the whole station coming alive and firing on me and making it hell just to even get close to the admin center, right? Last night was simple. Last night was super simple. I got my org all hyped up really for no reason. <laughs> I got them anxious and nervous for no reason. Um, so we got there, we landed perfectly, had zero like conflict the first tower we chose which was the far well i guess it's i guess it's rel relative to how you land but it, for us it was the far left tower um, we walked into the base of that tower and killed the lieutenant um, got the codes it gave us the coordinates for the connex farm or which is the opposite side of the admin platform you spend most of your time there uh, trying to find this other dude or the boss so there you go um this map is really good and then you can get into the next the next slides will get into the actual platform themselves so the slonky platformer shows you the different towers and then you can just go click right through so if you're an org organizer uh, wow if you're an org organizer <laughs> good lord uh take these pictures share them with your organization in your discord and let them have that intel before they get into siege of orison it's a really good like I don't know, uh, orientation before you get into the mission. All right, let's keep going. We're like three fourths of the way through this. The admin center, nine tells Lieutenant Art Kelvin. Now things get even more dangerous as the admin center can only be reached by ship. This platform's anti-air defense can only be disabled via the master iffy on the barge. So you have to destroy them to prepare your team for a hot drop and expect no less brutal resistance on the ground. So that, that first piece, we didn't have to do that. We just showed up and landed, like I said. So interesting there. All right, Central Cargo Barge, Nine Tails Commander Mendo Ren. It's finally time for you and the surviving volunteers to face off against Nine Tails Commander Mendo Ren in the final battle. Storm the cargo barge docked at the admin center, break the resistance, and capture the access codes. Then you'll have to find the iffy in a container maze. There you go. That's uh, the Connex yard I was talking about and disable the no-fly zone around Inspiration Park. By then, your friends can fly their own ships into the area and help evacuate any remaining players. Interesting. Interesting. So this is funny. Um, last night, we disabled everything. We got, like, we completed the mission. We were exfilling the Connex Yard and when I got into my Ares Inferno, the moment I took off, I got blown out of the sky. One of the turrets came on and decided to, you know, end my time playing. 
<laughs> so I died, got my 230,000 UEC, so that was nice. But I stranded the other 13 of my, my org members because their A2 was destroyed. So they were just sitting there waiting for me to come back with my Cutter Rambler. <laughs> so that'd be hilarious to pick them up um, in that small ass ship. But when I got there, I was trespassing and they impounded my vehicle. And I believe this is why, right? Because we didn't disable, right? We didn't disable the no-fly zone around Inspiration Park. Interesting. I'm going to share that with my org after this uh, after this episode. Last but not least, siege or break the siege. While the ships featured below are provided to CDF participants as part of the siege event, you can add them to your personal fleet from now until February 5th. Real quick, the 11 vehicles. The A2 Hercules, the Ares Inferno, the Ares Ion, the Buccaneer, C2 Hercules, C8X Pisces Expedition, the Corsair, the Cyclone MT, the Cyclone TR, the Hammerhead, and the Spartan. And the special upgrade, the limited time war bond offer special upgrade right now is the C2 Hercules. So... There you go. That is the details of the event, right? Of what you can expect between now and February 5th. Go do it with friends. We had a couple of non-org members join us. They were just on the platform and we scooped them up. So it was no it was not only just us 14. We also had two or three randos um, in our group as well. So we had 16 people moving at, you know, moving from platform to platform, which is something that is just incredible to see. Um in star citizen so go with friends and if not most people are going to be welcoming right when if you just join them on an elevator um just be I say be smart that sounds horrible um be courteous right because there is a whole discord conversation happening um there's a verbal communication strategy that's happening so if you're kind of doing your own thing you might be causing a little bit of a disruption in their operation but again don't shy away from Siege of Orison. Go do it. Go do it now while it's live. Because once it's over, then you can go back to doing your mining, your salvaging, any other game loop that suits your fancy. And with that, let's get into the lore for this episode, episode 43, Siege of Orison. <laughs> So we already covered some of the lore of Siege of Orison in their article for the event. It mentioned a few of these entities. And so I wanted to go through each entity, uh, share my screen for those of you on YouTube, and just make sure we're all tracking who these players are. So the first one is the advocacy, right? You heard that first mentioned a couple minutes ago. The Advocacy is an inter-system police force formed in standard Earth year 2523, serving the United Empire of Earth, UEE. The director of the Advocacy reports to the High Advocate and oversees all law enforcement throughout the UEE. While local systems and planets do have their own police and security, the Advocacy supersedes their authority and its agents are authorized to exercise more power in pursuit of crimes across systems. So here, uh, I don't know, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble probably uh, bringing this up. Don't cancel me. But the way I see this is kind of like uh, in America, you have the federal government that controls, you know, the military. But within the military, you have National Guards that are controlled by the states. Now, there is a difference between a state deployment and a federal deployment. So, like, in the National Guard, you could deploy on a federal recognition and go deploy to the Horn of Africa, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, whatever the, the locations are. Or the governor of your state can deploy you on a state recognition um, and do state operations. So I live in Texas. I'm not going to talk about the politics of this. I will never talk about politics on this show. But the facts of the matter right now is uh, the governor of the state of Texas activates the Texas Army National Guard, uh, and they are at the border, right, wrong, or indifferent. 
they're at the border. Well, then the federal government comes in and says, well, we could activate you on a federal level and pull you off the border. So there's this dynamic between the federal entities and state entities in America. I see the advocacy like this. The advocacy is this overarching kind of federal presence that controls um, security and militia and, and those efforts, um, even though you have Crusader security, you've got Hurston security, et cetera, right? So that is a real life example of what I think this is. Let's move on. The next uh, mention was the Militia Mobilization Initiative. Here we go. The Militia Mobilization Initiative is a United Empire of Earth government program introduced in 2946 to make advanced armaments available for purchase by civilian militias in areas threatened by the Van Duel. The official order states that it is intended quote, to embolden the general public to help defend the empire, end quote. In addition, the initiative offers subsidies, uh, subsidies for the bulk purchase of weaponry. The Aegis Dynamics Eclipse, Bomber, and RSI Polaris were made available on the civilian market as part of this effort. So this year when the RSI Polaris launches, <laughs> you can thank the Militia Mobilization Initiative for that. <laughs> oh, stirring up the hornet's nest. We're probably not going to see the Polaris this year, but one can dream. Last, the last mention, um, actually it was probably the very first one, but the Civilian Defense Force. Um, you'll see a lot of the CDF during Evictus Launch Week, right? Obviously, because that's a military. Well, you'll see all three of these a lot during the Invictus Launch Week. So here's the Civilian Defense Force. Uh, the CDF is a civilian militia connected to the United Empire of Earth Advocacy, founded in 2947, so a year later the advocacy formed, or the, the Militia Mobilization Initiative was formed. Um, it was created with the enactment of the <laughs> Militia Mobilization Init Initiative as a way for law enforcement to enlist the public to help with larger scale threats in the system. The CDF program is currently run under advocacy supervision, so local law must petition the advocacy for authorization. And I don't necessarily know why, but I always think of the draft. Whereas the draft, though, the draft is like put upon you. So like you are asked to join the draft, like and you're pulled, you're pulled from the civilian sector into uh, the, the military sector. Um, this is like volunteering so you're a civilian and you're you're basically saying you're picking up arms and you're defending uh, so maybe this is more of like the national guard i guess like you're not always on you're not actually part of uh the military but you are on occasion we don't really have anything like this in america but that's the closest i think that we can get okay and so there we have it. So there is the lore behind Siege of Orison. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, again, I, it helps me, uh, it helps motivate me. It helps give me a purpose as why I'm playing Siege of Orison. Siege of Orison is fun with or without the lore, but it's awesome to kind of understand the workings at play, right? And it is, it's a larger conversation when you're talking about 50 plus systems, right? In this game. Last but not least, portfolio, pyrotechnic amalgamated. This is all things pyro. So as we expect 4.0 to drop, you know, this summer to the end of the year, we will see pyro this year in the PU, according to Jared Huckabee and the last Inside Star Citizen. Um, these things are becoming more and more important. So yes, we did cover this in Jump Town 1102. We're covering it again. We're going to end the podcast after this lore reading. So here we go. Portfolio, Pyrotechnic Amalgamated, uh, originally found in Jump Point 1102. Let's go. Let's see how many words I can screw up. <laughs> Tromo Novellin, that didn't take long. <laughs> Tromo Novellin insisted he wasn't a gambler. Born into a family that struggled to eke out a living, he claimed he only took calculated risks 
but none would be more daring than pouring his life savings into launching Pyrotechnic Amalgamated in 2409. Rich beyond his wildest dreams, at the age of 30, after the sale of a data management company he founded with a friend in university, Novellan wasn't one to rest on his laurels. He spent years courting investors for a new venture, Pyrotechnic Amalgamated, but most financiers looked at the crowded mining field and Novellan's inexperience in it and passed. Novellan remained undeterred against the advice of family and friends. He didn't know it at the time, but this high-risk, high-reward move would set the tone for the company, one that saw Pyrotechnic Amalgamated achieve incredible highs, including the discovery of two systems before the accumulated risk finally dragged it down. No risk, no reward. According to Novellan, the discovery of Vega in 2402 was the key moment that inspired him to found Pyrotechnic Amalgamated. Newly rich and in search of a new business venture, discussions with his husband, a lawyer representing a mining concern fighting for the rights to a massive claim on Selen, Vega 3, Selene, Vega 3, opened Novellan's eyes to the profit potential that an untapped piece of the frontier could offer. Meanwhile, some of his fondest childhood memories were joining his aunt on mining runs that endeared him to the profession and sparked an obsession with geology. Novellan spent two years researching the industry and assessing its business practices. He identified several areas where his prospective company could forge a strategic advantage, but he refused to specify them in the business plan to ensure potential investors wouldn't steal and implement them elsewhere. After years of searching for investors, only a few had agreed to back his venture, so Novellan, in 2409, made the bold call to self-fund the rest of it. The risk was massive but his timing couldn't have been better. Humanity discovered Virgil in 2412 and fast-tracked the terraforming of the first planet due to favorable conditions. To encourage private investment, the UNE allowed mining companies early access to prospect the system and bid on mining rights. Rather than employing the systemic scan grid technique, popular with most mining organizations due to its thoroughness, Pyrotechnic amalgamated prospecting ships were outfitted to scan in the style of explorers, covering as much area as possible during their first pass before honing in on small anomalies for further investigation. Other companies mocked the pyrotechnic amalgamated ships speeding across the system, but their unique approach allowed them to identify and ultimately underbid on several lucrative locations. The windfall profits from these claims enabled the company to expand and reinvest in technologies that kept them on the cutting edge for decades. As humanity entered a golden age of expansion in the mid-25th century, no mining company was better positioned to explore these systems and identify viable claims than pyrotechnic amalgamated. Despite these successes, Novellan's ultimate goal was to discover a system believing that finding one would be enough to sustain the company for centuries and establish its name in history. He created an exploration division whose sole purpose, <laughs> sole provision, sole purpose, was to find new jumps and required all company and contracted ships to share their flight data with it. He would retire in 2457 without achieving this dream, but the systems he put in place would eventually pay off. In 2469, the crew of the company tanker Rustabout noticed a gravitational anomaly while crossing Kano and filed a detailed report with the Exploration Division. It remained overlooked until 2493 when CEO Cecile Uchia ordered legacy flight records to be reassessed to factor in recent scientific advancements in jump point detection. By then, pyrotechnic amalgamated fortunes had soured its pioneering exploration and scanning practices had become widespread within the industry. Losing its competitive advantage and exhausting several profitable veins left pyrotechnic amalgamated in a precarious position. 
Industry insiders believe the company would need a miracle to survive. This decades-old flight data from Restabout would provide it. Pyromania. It didn't take long for the exploration ship dispatched by Pyrotechnic Amalgamated to discover the new jump point and take preliminary scans of the system. Insiders claim that CEO Uchiha screamed in celebration upon receiving news of the discovery and then screamed in frustration upon seeing that the system suffered from an unpredictable solar flares, <laughs> which are amazing to see in the game. Still, significant mineral deposits on Pyro 2 and the presence of water and breathable atmosphere on Pyro 3 convinced Uchiha to direct executives to devise a plan to assess and exploit the system. Pyrotechnic Amalgamated registered its discovery with the UNE and named the system in honor of both the company and the system's volatile star. CEO Achiha lobbied the UNE to claim the system, which would open the floodgates of government and subsidies and resources to police and make living and traveling across it more manageable. Yet, government officials decided the, un the unstable sun was too dangerous and decided not to claim it, leaving those responsibilities to anyone who wanted to work the system. Pyrotechnic Amalgamated immediately established operations on the system's most substantial mining deposits and bolstered its security forces to strongly, quote, discourage others from developing their own. While most mining sites were on Pyro 2, the company built a majority of the staging sites, processing centers, and habitation encampments on the more hospitable Pyro 3. Still, the looming threat of solar flares made Pyrotechnic Amalgamated reluctant to establish a permanent headquarters on either planet, forcing the company to adopt a radical and expensive alternative. Construction began on McEwen Station in 2506, named in honor of the Restabout Watch officer who noticed the gravitational anomaly. The station was designed to be a massive and awe-inspiring operational hub for the company. Yet it wasn't long before this ambition clashed with reality. Construction cost overruns, disappointing mine profits from Pyro 2, and a downturn within the wider mining industry combined to drag down the company's bottom line. In late 2508, CEO Uchiha slowed construction of the station due to liquidity issues. Liquidity. Yeah, liquidity. Liquidity? <laughs> liquidity issues, and seriously considered abandoning it until another discovery convinced her otherwise. Ruinous. In 2510, a pyrotechnic amalgamated security force hunting an outlaw crew ran deep space scans that returned an unusual result. The company dispatched an exploration ship that discovered a jump into a new system. Scans showed a promising asteroid belt but no habitable planets. Financially strained, Pyrotechnic Amalgamated decided not to pursue interests in the system. They registered it with the UNE under the name Novellan and used the finder's fee to fill the budget shortfall in constructing McEwen Station. Construction on McEwen Station was completed in 2512. It streamlined mining and supply operations for the company's operations within the system and provided an additional revenue stream from the sale of fuel, food, and other supplies to independent miners traveling to and from the Velen. The discovery of the Terra system in 2516 and a jump from it to Pyro also boosted traffic to the station. Meanwhile, Pyrotechnic Amalgamated attempted to capitalize on its proximity to Terra by bidding on mining rights to several sites in the system, but in a now infamous incident, the company wildly overbid for the Arroyo load after data from a faulty scanner convinced executives that it was worth 10 times its true value. Then in 20 feet, 2539, a jump was discovered from the Velen to Gerzel, placing it in the middle of the brewing human Xi'an Cold War. The government quickly restricted access to the system and renamed it Hadrian. The loss of civilian access to the system noticeably reduced traffic to McEwen Station. By 2542, many of the company's mines within Pyro had become significantly depleted, and aggressive attempts to find significant deposits elsewhere were unsuccessful. 
The loss of traffic to McEwen Station also meant that the station's operational costs exceeded what Prior Technic Amalgamated made in the system for that year. The company attempted to sell the station to the government, pitching it as the perfect resupply hub for Hadrian, but failed to secure a deal. Pyrotechnic Amalgamated spent the 2550s shrinking its workforce, reducing its areas of operation, and liquidating assets to stay afloat. Following the First Tavaran War, as shield tech advancements from the Tavaran made their way to civilian ships, there was a glimmer of hope that the company could leverage the tech to access and mine parts of the system that were previously too dangerous. Yet, the new shield tech also meant outlaws could more easily survive and thrive within the system. Having drastically reduced its security forces as a cost-saving measure, pyrotechnic amalgamated ships found themselves under constant attack, which made exploiting those meager and hard-to-reach resources not worth the cost. In its, well, in its desperate last days, the company stripped anything of value from the McEwen station and abandoned its operations there, leaving the station in ruins. The name Ruin Station was bestowed upon it by outlaws and squatters. In 2563, the company finally declared bankruptcy, but would not be forgotten thanks to the discovery of the system that shares its name. And there you have it, the whole history of Pyro. <laughs> so as we look towards Pyro launching this year, I hope that quite lengthy portfolio drop that we had on Tuesday, I hope it helps understand kind of how it came to be and why it's lawless. Well, thank you for joining Beyond the Verse Star Citizen podcast for episode 43. I hope this finds everybody well. If you're interested in joining the conversation, we respond to almost everything that happens on a weekly basis on our socials. You can join our socials at forward slash BTV underscore cast. And that's Twitter, Instagram, Blue Sky. That's a thing now, I guess. <laughs> but you can find us there. If you want to join the conversation via email, we will read all emails that are sent to us. And that's contact at beyondtheversehq.com. You can respond to our Q&A and polls that we ask at the end of every single episode on Spotify. Um, or or and you can watch us on video uh, replay on YouTube and that's youtube.com forward slash at BTV underscore cast. Again, I hope this finds everybody well. Take care and safe travels as you traverse beyond the verse. Thanks everybody. <laughs>